Hi, I'm Jeff Yarger. I'm a professor of chemistry, biochemistry, and physics at ASU. And I'm Vladimir Mujica. I'm a professor of chemistry at ASU. So, Vladi, we're teaching BCH 341 online this spring 2019 semester. And the way we've kind of decided to do it is we're giving, you know, three midterm exams, one comprehensive final. And we've kind of broken up instead of trying to collaborate on you know, every exam, you know, as far as you and I writing them together, we've kind of taken it where I take the lead on exam one, you take the lead on exam two, and, and keep going in, in that general direction. So uh, we're looking at exam two, which uh, as we're recording this, students are taking at the moment. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and what we have in front so of us- So we won't is, release this until midnight. So we won't release this till students have finished it. But uh, what we're hoping to do is, is get this recorded um, and so it can be edited and we can give it to students after the due date, but during the process in which they're doing a peer reviewer grading and with the hopes that this video might help them you know, be able to better or more accurately and consistently, you know, do peer evaluations or reviews. Um, and so, uh, um, you know, starting, you know, let's looking at some of the logistics, you know, they, we basically given them two or three days. We've kind of treated the exam like an, like a take home, it's a, yeah, it's a take home absolutely. exam. Absolutely. And because it's an online course, we even encourage them to use, you know, any resources available to them, right? They can, they can even try to, to work in groups as, as long as everybody works. Yeah, yeah. So um, we've given them a very precise due date, you know, with a very precise time because they can be anywhere in the world working this. We give this to them as a single PDF portable document format. And so we want that as returned. Now, a lot of times this can cause what I would call IT or technical difficulties, but I would say even overcoming that is just smart. I mean, portable document format is ubiquitous as a as just what it states, a portable document format to consistently be able to show not just scientific information, but every journal article you would look at, most modern books, et cetera. I yeah. mean, this is really the format you, and any Jeff, program that you would edit in, you should yeah. be able to save it. Jeff, just to come in there, because we have talked about that several times, we encourage students to use word processing or latex or whatever they want to use but the fact is that many of our students, they, they write by hand and then they take a picture of that and upload to, to, to a file. That is probably the most cumbersome way of doing that and it's difficult to read. So we would like to encourage the students to do it some other way. Right. Right. There's several things about that. One is, like you said, it's just multi-step. You have to then, the student has to worry how good is their handwriting because it's, you can only grade what you can read yourself. And, and um, but then beyond that, they're taking a digital picture. They're trying to upload it. They can end up with all sorts of problems with as far as the size of their PDF because they're taking some, you know, 24 megapixel, you know, camera picture of something that should have been digitized at a much smaller yeah. black and white mm -hmm. rate. There's all sorts of IT things. Now, I like to go down one line and say, why have we done it this way? Usually they would give their full name, student IDs and everything for verification. It's because one of the things we were, were testing out and implementing this semester, that's a major part of this is kind of a peer um, review uh, or what I would call peer grading process that we're in a sense trying out. And that's why it's just extra credit, but it's really with the effort that this would be an integral part in future semesters. And just like when you and I submit a journal article, almost everything we would submit is peer reviewed. And while it's not 100% the case, we would say anonymous peer review is still the norm. And so I think, uh, you know, even I am even encouraging of double blind, where, where you don't even know who you're reviewing. Yeah. And so um, to some degree, just by keeping initials and you know, some type of email so that you know, a peer reviewer could contact you is kind of the simplest information. By submitting it on Canvas, we know who the students are and their ID and everything because they have to submit it under their username. So it's not a process, it's not a problem for the instructors or TA to identify them. This just makes it a little easier if it gets out in the public that it's, it's 
not directly connected to a student by their full name or, or ID numbers that could be compromised right, privacy. Because the idea with confidential peer review is to give, you know, the freedom to the reviewer. Right. And this without is without the attachment, you know, they, they might be this might be a friend, must be right. a, but you want them to be able to say something, yeah, you know, even critical. The, yeah. Now, and that's what Canvas does where it's they get a bunch of, if they submit their exam, all the comments and in a sense, peer grades or points and rubrics are all, they just get, you know, it by number one, two or three, four, you know, like they don't know who it was, which of their peers was giving it. But this, this tries to keep it a little blind on the front side as well. And then just going through the, um, you know, instructions, we've tried to keep this consistent to what uh, we've done on exam one and now on exam two, which is kind of eight problems. The first four were 10 points, then the last four were 15 uh, points. The first ones being a little more conceptual, a little more like quizzes or simpler uh, discussion type questions. The last ones being more, maybe longer, more involved uh, exercise type problems. A total of 100 points. And as we've already talked about in, in past videos, the, the real point to this is, is that they show all their work, they give links to where they're using any data, um, et cetera. And, and half of their evaluation is just being able to know where, good, where they can find good links to good thermodynamic data and finding good resources by the end of this class. Yeah, so and this is something very important here because in this particular test, many of the questions require thermodyna thermodynamic data and we are not supplying it. So right. you have to go and, and, and see what you need. And, and yeah. this is unlike, you would say, the more common exam they're used to, which is to walk into a classroom or walk to their browser and have a lockdown browser for an hour. That's where, with these very small time limitations, oftentimes they're given data sheets. They're, yeah. they're, they're spoon-fed the data they need. But that's not the real world. The real world is you got to know where good sources of data are. And we've tried to provide that. We've tried to give them links to, for example, NIST. Um, you know, NIST has a, a large database, uh, et cetera. Um, you know, and several resources as well as a whole on um, biopchem.education, a resource page uh, of thermodynamic data. Okay, so let's dive in to the exam and, and look at some of the questions, okay? Uh, the first one is what I would say is, is really looking at, um, you know, conceptually uh, some ideas that the, the main part of this exam is on uh, looking at chemical and phase equilibria in systems. And so uh, your first question is really, you know, looking at some things from a conceptual standpoint. Right? And so the entropy of an open system uh, cannot, um, I always like to highlight what I think of as being the, cannot decrease in a spontaneous process. So, you know, a lot of people, I can, you know, asking this question is so important because conceptually understanding spontaneous processes, which we automatically, you know, what, what runs to my mind is where is, you know, delta G in a, you know, in a constant temperature pressure type, you know, environment, what is it doing, et cetera. But you're asking, you know, specifically about, you know, yeah. something with the second law, which is entropy. Right. Um, and then that's your saying that. <clears throat> and then you've also given another huge hint here. Entropy, you know, one of the first things students mess up is whether they're talking about entropy in a closed system or an open one. Now, you know, and, and I think what you're going to highlight here, knowing that this is false, is, is that, you know, entropy of the overall, of, of everything, system and the surroundings, must increase. You know, uh, that's a second law statement. But, you know, but yet another formulation of, uh, you know, is, you've even stated here that this is an open system. Yeah. You know, and so just because that's the that's the, the 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 very important thing that second law. I mean, one of the uh, the, uh, the ways to postulate is that the the entropy of the universe, it's either remains constant or increases. Yeah, and that's where I think of reversibility. Yeah. When you, any the minute somebody says reversible, I think okay, delta s of everything is going to more or less you know is going to be equal to zero. As soon as you say not irreversible. 
the it's always gonna it's gonna increase. Right. So if we if we write it here for the entire system is the change of entropy for the universe is the change of entropy in the system plus its change of entropy in the environment. This quantity has to be larger or equal to zero for any process. Right. Um, now the thing is that we are asking about this one. And that one can do is no restriction. It can be anything. Can do anything. It can be right? negative, positive. Uh, and zero, it's a very whatever. important concept to get across that that it can do anything because it's not the entire thing. It just it, you know uh, is pointing. Okay, I think we've uh, given the equilibrium constant depends on temperature. So K is dependent on temperature uh, only. Uh, the composition of the equally mi mixture in a gas reaction is insensitive or not sensitive to the external pressure. You know, or a lot of people just write P, you know, like that. Um, and I think you're bringing across two or three very important points here. One is, you know, the idea of you know, equilibrium mixtures, et cetera. But external pressure, when we first introduce work, almost inevitably it's PDV work. God, I hate that this pen is doing this, but, you know. And we often skip, or, or textbooks quickly move over, that this is talking about the external right. pressure, and it's right. only when you, when you make the assumption that the external pressure is equal to the internal pressure, and you then can you start moving on. Then, the then you star. start doing the integrals and right. stuff. Right. And, and we often quickly gloss over that point. Um, now, I think the other reason this question is so pertinent is when we introduce equilibrium, while we usually think of it at the end of the day in biochemistry or even in complex chemicals, we start thinking of you know, the products concentrations over the reactants concentrations. And we're almost always thinking of, you know, aqueous concentrations. But when we first introduce this, we almost always do it through partial pressures yeah, in the gas, the phase. gas phase. And yeah. that's what you're yeah. highlighting. And that's how most in both introductory chemistry as well yeah. as most physical and, chemistries. Yeah, and as you were saying, the, 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 the fact is that the equilibrium constant depends on temperature only but, but the position of equilibrium, the composition of equilibrium, depends on pressure too. Right. In such a way that when you increase there the There are partial pressure, pressures of right. all sorts of things. Now they have to all equal this. In, so, in such a way that when you increase or decrease the total pressure, equilibrium displaces to the right or to the left right. to compensate for the difference in such a way that the value of K is well, constant. Well, is Prince. Yeah. Right. So, so and that's what you're, I think, getting to the point here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, change in external pressure has no effect on the melting temperature of a pure substance. This one you would think they would just immediately know. I mean, like, in fact, um, you know, famously, right, you can take ice out of your, you can take ice at minus 20 degrees and not change the temperature and melt it. By how? just increase its pressure. That's yeah. all you would have to do to melt the ice. Talking about non-intuitive, right? Mm -hmm. How many substances can you melt them by increasing, by increasing their pressure, pressure at constant right. temperature? Right. Only right. things with negative Clapeyron slips, which we're gonna come back to later yeah, in right. your exam. So, water. yeah, okay. So, and I, we could belabor this point, but I, I love that looking at phase diagrams, we're often we often just use temperature. It's the one we're most familiar with. We think about melting things, we think about evaporating things. Pressure isn't near as intuitive to us as chemists. Right, right. It is and to geologists or other, but, but it's important to realize that that variable actually is what gives most of phase space, you know. Right, and if we want to understand that in more mathematical terms, then we write the variation of the chemical potential and then we see immediately that this is VDP minus SGT. Right. So we see that the dependence of the chemical potential on pressure is connected to the molar volume. Right. So if we want to look at this in mathematical terms, so therefore, change in external pressure indeed will change the chemical potential. And because phase equilibrium is dictated by the equality of two chemical potentials, then it will shift. The, I mean, each time we see a phase equilibrium diagram, we have to think a, 
point in an equilibrium line corresponds to a situation in which the chemical potential of two or more substances are equal. Yes. So. Yeah. Okay. The chemical reaction for a standard um, reaction gives free energy. And like you said, like indicating it here or, or sometimes like that is positive, is positive, uh, is positive, is impossible. Um, a chemical potential for which the standard state is positive is not possible in a sense, is not possible. So in a sense, you're saying, um, you know, it always has to be um, positive. Well, yeah, that's one way. I mean, in, in this, the, the, the question pretends just the standard reaction. Uh, yeah, I think of this as is you're you're getting to the point that any Gibbs free energy can be it's Gibbs free energy in its standard right, state, right? You know, uh, plus Ma, you know, yeah, or RTL yeah, minus RT, yeah, RTLN, yeah, right. Um, and so that's I mean, like this I understand, but but this can be whatever, whatever, whatever. whatever. again. So I, I think that's kind of the point you're trying oh, yeah, to, absolutely. to, to absolutely. get that, to. That's we, we, we understand that it is the reaction, the, the, the total Gibbs energy that gives you a criterion for which direction. Yeah, something. not just the standard state is and, just giving you just that. Why, you know. And, and you know, if we want to push the argument that this is what, if you, if you, if you move a bit down, if you want to push the argument, then I, I include a sentence there saying that in principle, no chemical reaction is impossible because you can always pay, even if the, the free energy is, is positive, because that will, that, that will imply is that the reaction is not going to be spontaneous, but you can always drive the reaction in the other direction if you pay for it energetically. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and and we've discussed that in one of the discussion right. questions as well. Right. And just one thing before, okay. you know, because we have this peer review. I mean, in principle, the, the grade in this is whether, well, all of them, the, the, the right answer is false for all of them. Now, if the reviewer thinks that there is some merit in, a, in some discussion, you can give points for that too, but that's right. up to the, uh, the reviewer. Because and this is one of the benefits of making a peer review and also making this something that has partial credit. In fact, I would probably go to the extreme of saying, you know, if, if basically they wrote nearly a, a really good comment that just missed one little fundamental, like, hey, you know, the Gibbs free energy, say they mark true here, but they, they said like, you know, for it to be spontaneous, it overall has to be right. negative. And they just missed some little concept, if they, but they if kind they go of in the it. right direction, yeah, but then the, I would say- The answer is incorrect. Know, Give them some points. Oh, I would say, even like 50, 50 right. to 75 percent right. of the overall. So, so this is the is difference. You see, if you have this on a computer, then the problem is true or false, and then the computer will take well true as wrong, and there's nothing else to add. But peer reviewing implies that you read it, you have comments here. Let's say for this particular one, the condition for a chemical reaction to be spontaneous that the reaction gives energy, not the standard reaction gives energy, should be negative. One could also add that in general, there are no impossible reactions. One can always compensate negative free energy trying to change in the condition. I mean, if, if one of your, of your, or your mates or classmates writes this and then for some reason, he Just writes mark the wrong true, one. Yeah. Give them something. You, you count something. off maybe one point for the final exactly. answer, but most of the, exactly. I would say 80, 90% comes in, in their into, explanation. Into, into explanation. Yeah, okay. I think we're both on the same page with that one. Ooh. Um, okay. Uh, here you're, you're basically comparing uh, thermal engines to living systems. Uh, and again, you're asking for, in a sense, um, you're asking them to explain things, you know. Yeah. So, um, and, you know, thermal engines operate under temperature gradients. I think famously something like a Stirling right. engine where you have a cold and a hot reservoir and you show that you can, you can transfer yeah. it. That's famously one of the Which first Which is things certainly we... not our case. Right. But, but we it are is mostly isotherm. when we teach, when we teach thermodynamics, that's the first thing we teach exactly. is hot and cold reservoirs. Exactly. What, how do you transfer exactly. this? When you put, it, it, it involves the laws. When you put a hot and cold body, 
energy, you know, which way does heat flow? That's what we teach. Right. When is equilibrium? Can uh, we can we do work out of this temperature? Temperature, difference? yeah, only when there is. And yeah. the answer the answer is yes. You, we can you can do work, but you cannot do more than this that one what the second law allows, allows. you to do. Yeah. So yeah. there is a limitation. But you can transform always work into heat, but the difference heat into work, there is a limitation for that. And, right. and this is the content of the second law. And so I, I think the point of this question is, is that we learn a lot of thermodynamics through looking at engines, through looking at thermal processes, engines, Carnot cycles, uh, you know, Stirling engines, etc. But this is biochemistry, and we're in living systems. And to first approximation, we're isothermal. You know, we're not a temperature difference, you know, uh, et cetera. So, you know, let's look at some of those differences in this problem and especially how they're associated with the second law. And so, uh, you know, the first one is pointing out like, you know, we know by having these huge thermal differences that, you know, how you can get work out of that. That is what, you know, we fundamentally look at, but you're asking them to now, how do we do this in an isothermal case? And, you know, we're all very familiar with it. We intake, I think of it as we do chemical work. You know, right. what we do is intake right. things that have chemical work. That's why we learned about enthalpy. That's why we did all these things right. to learn that there is energy in these chemical bonds. Right. That's why we eat food. You yeah, know? right, right. But at the same time, this is true. But the, the other very important difference is that we do not operate under equilibrium conditions. No. Because yeah. if we were, if we had to wait for equilibrium, equilibrium means essentially nothing. death. Yeah, nothing. Yeah. Equilibrium is in death the cosmos the as well. That's what they. Right, how right. long till? So we yeah. operate on the steady state conditions, which is a, well. And that's and your that's point it. too, and that is, I think, a very great th point about this. And this is something you can only do in a take-home exam. People will mix up equilibrium with steady state all the time. And you're asking them to really think about some of those differences and realize in open systems where there's inputs and outputs okay. that you can still have a steady state. And it has some properties like equilibrium, but it's not equilibrium. It's not equilibrium. It's not equilibrium. And, 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 in the, and the same main way. thing is that when you have a, a source and a drain, which is what you did for a state, when you did for a steady state, then what happens is that let's say the concentration, you are increasing the concentration from the intake and depleting the concentration out, you know, in the outgo of the system, in such a way that concentrations remain constant in time, which is something very important for us as right. living systems. And we don't we don't want the concentration of right. Our, well, our and it's very important critical because, chemicals because it, saying steady state is not saying equilibrium, but often they get interchanged and often it's they get true. used. And when you make that assumption, it's critical to know what you're really thinking right. here. And right. that's what you're asking them to critically mm -hmm. think about in number two or part B. And I really, I really enjoyed that one. Uh, are there biological processes that occur that reduce? We've talked about this in a discussion question and everything. You know, um, let's face it, we wouldn't exist if you couldn't you know, reduce entropy on a local, you know, scale. Right, right like, so, but once you accept it, how do we reconcile this fact with the second law of thermodynamics? We already gave the answer to this. Right. Because we are not, we are not closed systems. Right. Uh, so it doesn't matter, we, we, the many processes in our bodies, they can reduce entropy at the expense that something else is happening yeah. somewhere else. Yeah. And, you know, 90% 90, 90 of the time when you dig it back to its origin, it's our sun, you know, that's, <laughs> that's uh, increasing enough entropy to, oh, uh, to process then, a lot of this. And then I have to add something here, just uh -oh. you see a minor mistake here. Okay. Many biological processes occur reducing entropy. This does not. Ooh. This does not continue. Does not constitute a violation of the second law. I for this is a typo. Okay, so it That's, will be. This does not. Yes. Yeah. I agree. Okay, we'll make sure that gets corrected. Corrected. Um, and you know, I like to just point out, not to belabor, but you know, this really does lead down a rabbit hole of so many interesting things. In fact, one I've been looking at a lot late, lately is when you look at you know, as a function of entropy increasing, you know, complexity of some sort, and that you can, you go through a complexity maximum and back, you know, down in a lot of these systems when you look at like Shannon, um, you know, complexity values, et cetera. I mean, there's a whole field of modern research, you know, in this area to carry things beyond these simple ideas, but, you know, how 
you know, entropy plays such a critical role in life, you know, yeah. time zero. There's so many, we could probably belabor this for too and long. Again, of a in terms of peer review and grading. Yeah. You see, these are possible answers. These are not the only answers. These are only ways. To there are lots of ways to think about so it. So if you are peer reviewing this particular question, then think with an open mind. Keep an open mind here. Right. So See think what of they're different really ways. really trying to infer. Exactly. And that, that's what you are going to give them points for. Right. The, ins the instructor or the TA, whoever is going to grade this, this is how you, how you should look into this. The yeah. three questions, and if you have that the information is there, even if there is not in the same order as I'm presenting here, that's fine. Well, and in a sense, to me, this is a real test of peer review. This is something that would be very hard to ask as a question on an exam that didn't have peer review because you're asking a TA or ourselves mm -hmm. to read literally hundreds of paragraphs. Exactly. And that is just mind-numbingly hard to do in an active or in a, a very accurate you know, way. And But now, when you only have a subset, when each student is just looking at three or five others, they can really take some time. And it really enforces what they know by looking at how other people are explaining things and, and, and trying to make sense of it. It really helps reinforce their own knowledge on this important issue. Okay, uh, moving on to question three. The book doesn't spend much time with Carnot engines, but you would say it's it's often one of the critical things in in first, you know, putting a very simple system that you can put to gases and stuff. Where I even advise, I have I have videos on this as well, where I even encourage students to to think of this, like, you know, what does it mean to be here at point one? Think of yourself as having a a piston and a cylinder with some gas in it. What does it mean to isothermally you know, uh, expand, you know, let's make it obvious that it's expanding, you know, that gas, you know, et cetera. What does it mean, you know, to adiabatically, you know, expand something? How do you, you know, put an insulating wall around it? You know, to really think about it as an experimentalist, I think oftentimes these things become more concrete when you can put those kind of real, Absolutely. you know, piston cylinder type pictures to it, and this allows it in such a way. Now, then, I mean, as you then, said, then, immediately, for instance, this branch here, this cor corresponds to an expansion, an isothermal expansion. So you have your expansion here, but in order to keep the temperature constant, you have to heat you, up the system. And right. This is why there is heat going into well, the and, system if you want. And I think, it, it's so simple when you think about it in that terms, but I'm amazed how many students um, immediately think differently because of one simple thought. They immediately equate temperature to, in, you know, they think constant temperature, entropy can't, you know, they, they somehow, yeah. when they think heat, they think temperature. They think, oh, it stayed at the same temperature. Well, that means heat stayed the same. And this reinforces the idea that no, no, you know, you really need to think about entropy and temperature as correlating variables. But that, it's like saying that, oh no, you know, because you have a change in, you know, a constant volume, you can't, you know, yeah. change the pressure, you know. Yeah, because we have this idea, as you're saying, we have this wrong idea that if you have heat flowing into a system, it means that the system is going to increase the temperature. This right. is not necessarily true. Exactly. And because this illustrates this, it as well right, as any. Because in this particular case, because the volume is changing, yeah, and the pressure is changing, then this is not true. Yeah, exactly. And so you know, uh, um, I think this is really a, a great you know example from that standpoint. And what have you asked them to do? Consist down, down here. Oh, I'm missing. Aha, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Draw the entropy against temperature. So what they have right here is a pressure versus volume, you want entropy versus temperature. And you know, that's what the Carnot engine is doing is, is saying you have constant entropy, you know, sides, that's what adiabatic, you know, mm -hmm. means. Um, then you have places where the entropy is changing here and here. Are they changing equal and opposite? They've already looked at that through equations, you're asking to look at it kind of visually, in this case. And, and so, if you go down here. Yeah, and then you you then show that. A, yeah, we, we, we and, show and then, the explicit calculation. And you see one, the, the, the higher temperature, the lower temperature, one to two 
entropy increases during the isothermal. This is the, this will be the isothermal. Right. And then thermal. this is the adiabatic. And this is the adiabatic. adiabatic. Yeah. So in this part here, entropy does not and change. And then the reverse, you know. Reduce and so. Yeah, exactly. So they cannot cycle well, I think it's become, also important to realize rectangle. that almost any of these, like, of course, pressure volume, it's something they have an intuition for. Yeah. Entropy, temperature, not so much, but it's important to be able, I think, not just seeing equations, but putting it in graphical format. It's something that Gibbs himself started as, as using visualization or, or graphics to really help, you know, put a visualization to thermodynamics. And, and that's what you're asking them to do here to help better visualize uh, this entropic, you know, change. Um, yeah, and then we should you, say, do you want to say something about no, just very quickly here? Here is the total balance of, L, of entropy. And so the because you have a cycle and entropy is state function, the total balance for the system is zero, then the total balance for the for the universe is for the for the environment is also zero. So And this is for reversible. I mean, right. like again, like one of the things that we often don't explicitly state, you know, because this whole class we're talking about kind of reversible equilibrium thermodynamics for the most part. So, um, oh, you do explicitly state uh, reversibility. Right. Um, and you can tell that just because you're coming back to the same uh, point. Okay. Um, so I like this one. You're, you're making them do something where eventually they're going to, you know, they can do this in several ways. I, I saw the way you, you, can, you can do this where you actually, you know, plot the data and fit a line to it. To get that slope, which would, you know, or you can do it kind of pairwise, um, you know, just y2 over minus y1 over x2 over minus x1, right? Mm -hmm. Like you can just get the slope that way and kind of have an extra column for what the derivative or the slope of that is, right? And however they want to do it. And this is having to do with osmotic pressure, which the book does a really good example of showing like you can have like a semi permeable membrane, you can have something above it, and you can physically just watch the height. Right. And against gravity, what you're assuming is, you know, the mass of a current. And this is so practical. This is how manometers, mercury, water manometer, I mean, like this is something that you can physically just measure a height change to get what these osmotic pressures are. Right. And is so practical in biology, right? Osmotic pressure in cell, I mean like in cells, which are semi-permeable membranes and, you know, dialysis, you know, how they do separation in biology. I mean, osmotic pressure comes up a lot of places and is used very conveniently in a lot of ways to yeah. get things like molar that, mass. That's and, exactly what I like about this problem, that you are actually able to correlate concentration with the height of the column. Yeah. Um, and this is again where, just like on the Carnot engine, my advice to students is I literally, I guess I'm just a very visual person. I would always use something like a spreadsheet just to do these out and plot them just because I, I like to see things like that. And I always like to just draw little schematics here. You know, what does it look like? Your book gives you a good starting point. Do you expect the height to go up or down? What is it going against? It's going against gravity, you know, blah, blah, blah. Like, you know, just to kind of remind ourselves that this really has a tangible experiment associated with it. Um, uh, and again, like, you know, most of the partial credit credit comes in just that, like, you know, can they recognize that they're going to need to determine, is this linear? Do they get the slope right. correctly? Can right. they kind of draw something to show that they expect the height to change by how much? Again, you know? Yeah, and again, it helps a lot to make sure that uh, we understand what we are trying to plot, because we have this table and we, you know, in some cases uh, we, we we get questions, say, I start to plot in this and I don't get a, a, right. a, a straight well, line. Well, and you've even stated it right here. Like, it's not often just plotting, you know, this over this. Sometimes, like you said, it's the log of it or the inverse yeah. of it. We talked about this in kinetics. Uh, this comes across in kinetics a lot, where it's not, the two variables given or the data given that might not be linear, sometimes you have to get it in a mathematical form to linearize it, you know. Um, and, and you show that, you know, um, right here when you talk about how you would have to plot this based on this equation to get this, what you would expect to be linear. And I think you show it not graphically, but just showing these two and showing that you get a consistent, right. in a sense, what you would say, slope. We, right, which means 
that whatever you are plotting, the two point yeah looks they, like this. Yeah. So the slope is zero. Zero. Right. So uh, and and okay, you I mean you could have gotten this result without going into this virial expansion, but then you will have missed the fact that in many cases you cannot use this type of uh, obvious linear plot, you have to go through these other more complex. Yeah, and, and this is something, to bring it back to something they did on the last example, like the same is true oftentimes, for example, when you expand heat capacity. The first, you know, approximation, we usually just think of, ah, oh, you know, it has a constant heat capacity, so it, you know, but, and then we, we start adding, you know, almost always some type of expand, you know, some type of either polynomial or viral expansion. Uh, of something like heat capacity. And oftentimes those are small terms. They're not, rarely in this do you get these right. giant right. terms. But thermodynamics, it's amazing, you know, a, a one or 2% difference can be very important in real application, you know? And so sometimes you need that accuracy and it's nice to know that you can expand these things to the way where you can get that yeah, accuracy right. when needed. And, and it's also important, I mean, when, when you look at this this way, this expression here, I mean, we are so much used to write the equation for a straight line as a plus vx. Right. We immediately realize that this here is a <clears throat> and this here is b. And if we have b equal to zero, then of course y equal to a, which is what I'm doing there. Down yeah. here. So again, it's the mathematics and the graphics and the table and the concept. Everything has to right. go together. Right. Okay. And and this is uh, you know compared to what I did on example, this is a perfect one where you know you can easily make a spreadsheet, you know, an Excel sheet or Google sheet to to do a lot of this and 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 uh, plot and show a lot of this as well as a as a, just a completely you know um, you know different way to work the same you know problem. Okay, five looking. At, one of the whole chapters was on phase equilibria, and I think you're pointing out something that is is critical. Like the first phase diagram, almost everyone sees is of water, and in a sense, they see something that's very anomalous, mm -hmm. which is they see a slope, this negative slope for solid to liquid line, and they might think that's normal, but by far positive slopes are normal. I mean, if you just threw a dart at a periodic table or a compound, you're more likely or not. In fact, you know, this one you can almost name besides water, it's usually open tetrahedral networks like um, like carbon can have it, silicon, yeah. uh, I think SiO2, but uh, they're often these these open tetrahedral networks that have this uh, famous ability that, you know, they open up you know, in the solid state, the and solid they collapse state. a little bit in the liquid state. Yeah, because state. It, as we will see, the, the crucial thing is that when you go from liquid to solid, the density is reduced. Right. And this is what is so abnormal about this type of structures. Right. We know, and, and I think that's what you're asking them to get at in this case. Guess what? We know the entropy you know, as you go from a solid to a liquid to gas, it's always increased. So you're asking them to look at a Clapeyron slope, which is relating the pressure temperature to the entropy and volume. Well, as you go in that direction, you don't have to worry about entropy. We're not as, it's always going that way. It's the anomaly that actually the density or the volume between a solid and a la uh, uh, liquid can actually, there are some uh, there are some compounds and some elements, compounds like water, elements like silicon, where their liquids are actually, you know, more dense than their solids. And you're asking them to say why this is so important and why it's important for life and biological systems, right. why it's so important that icebergs or ice freezes on top of a lake and it doesn't sink to the bottom, mm -hmm. how that would affect us even being here or, or any type of life being able to form in right. general and, is what you're getting to at exactly. the end of this question. Yeah. But you're starting at the beginning, just making it just remind making them remember what, you know, DPDT does in its relationship to DSDV. Right. And they can look at this in several ways. I like to, you know, always bring it to Maxwell relations 
um, which I won't do out here, but you can, um, you can, this is a Maxwell relation in a sense as well. You know? It is, and it's also, I mean, again, each time you see a phase diagram, you have to read a point here as the chemical potential of the solid equal to the chemical potential of the gas in this particular case. If right. you look at it here, is the chemical potential of the solid to of the, the liquid. solid equal to the chemical potential of the liquid. And if you move to the right or to the left, one of the two chemical potentials is larger than the other. And so the, the moment you understand that a phase diagram is a way of representing a chemical potential diagram, then you understand many of these things immediately. Because again, the, if we move down here, it is <clears throat> the, 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 uh, the mathematical equation has to do with the equality of the chemical potential and how you can write the derivative, which is the, the, the first question, how right. you can write the derivative in terms of the entropy change and the volume change. And, and this one is always positive, so whatever this derivative is going to be depends on whether delta B is positive or negative. And it turns out to be the case that this is for water and this is for most of the other substances. So, Right, exactly. And then you've gone on to ask about some of those important things, both in, in part two and part three about, you know, because uh, ice floats on top of water because it's less dense, et cetera. And we again, also talk about the fate of fish. Huh? The fate of fish, yeah. Right. Or what you would say is anything, you know, it's very critical, you know, that you have that, in a sense, insulating layer of ice. And, you know, if you think about why the rest of it doesn't freeze below, yeah. you know, high heat capacity of and water, you know, the ability of, of the solid to, to float on top and to reflect, um, you know, so there, there's a lot, it, it's complicated, it, but there's a it, lot of things. And it's amazing that all these things that are absolutely critical to life on this planet depend on this single This fact. one thing. Yeah, when you have seas of methane, which other you know planets do, it, the, it's a it lot won't, different. It won't work that yeah, way. it doesn't. Yeah. It doesn't work quite the same. And I assume, not to belabor the point, but you would say the same here. Like most of it comes in, you know, what they write here, and and are they writing, you know, to give the if you're a peer reviewer, are they writing something, you know, in in an explanation where you can see that they are understanding conceptually, you know, what, uh, yeah. what we're looking for here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, whoop. Whoop. Okay. Um, 40, uh, being able to control pH is essential. Exactly. Um, you know, and then you're asking them, you know, several systems to look at this. The first one, just something we've talked about when we looked at before, which is, you know, when you're making buffers, which we had a whole discussion thing about this, it's really at the pKa value for that weak base that you that you get the most buffer action because that's really, you know, and, and you're asking them to look at that in several systems and yeah. be able to find good thermodynamic values. They're gonna find them easily for these, what I would call common, um, salt, weak acid base. Right. And that's things. pretty straight. It was just to, to emphasize yeah. that, th that this is very important and we can actually, you know, using a very simple equation, we can understand why a buffering action is largest when the concentration of the acid and, and base. And then you've asked them to specifically plot one. And I would go even one further. Like, I almost always love to ask, like, you know, plot, um, you know, pH uh, versus, you know, the concentration of different components for things like amino acids, thing, biologically right. relevant things where there's numerous pKa's going on. And you can, uh, you can use very simple approximations like uh, uh, Henderson-Hasselbach, mm -hmm. where it only considers two things at a time. And so it'll drop everything to zero. Right. Or you can take this as equations and write them out a matrix mm -hmm. where you really, if you really care about that kind of nanomolar range in some pH, you, you won't get that from the henderson hapel no, You'll have to that, linearize that, that out. Yeah. Because that equation, and, and that's what you have. Oops. Whoop. Here, I'll. Now disappear. No, no, okay. So you have the equation. And when you are going to actually, you know, this is an important thing that it tells you the initial pH can be calculated directly. Okay, so now again, the, the gradient of this. So 
there is an effective pH buffer range here that uses a particular convention that plus or minus one unit of pH. If somebody uses a, a different rule for this, it's okay because the important thing is that it has to be around yeah. the value. Of that the they pH. get conceptually what right. they're doing right. and that they, well, they explain one unit their, half their, a unit. Yeah, if they explain and yeah. justify, you know, hey, I'm using one and a half, two right. units and they justify why, that could be perfectly acceptable if they give justification. Right. And, the, that... and, the, and the other thing down here is again that when you look into into this type of equation, there is an approximation here. I mean, it's not it's not indicated there, but that this quantity here is constant as you add acetic acid. Right. Now, if when you are going to plot, you see you choose. A concentration of acetic acid that is larger than 0.1 or the order of 0.1, you are violating the approximation for this. So this is important too. I mean, you might say, okay, but how, how do we choose this? Well, because we it's, it's an approximate idea that we want the concentration of the acid to be at at most of 0.1, the concentration of the of the of the of the base. Now all these details are important because all these equations, they work on the cer on the certain assumptions. Right. And, and this is the important thing, that you go through the assumptions, you say, this and person this understand this, understands the assumption. And, uh, yeah. and, and this gets really critical when you start looking at things that get more complicated than just, you know, uh, to, like, like the first thing they usually see in this regard are like amino acids where you're going to have multiple pKa's or even, you know, some acid, you know, some phosphoric acids and others that have multiple pKa's. One of the first assumptions is when you get far away from the pKa of one of the acids that you just assume it's zero. And, you know, that is, you know, an assumption that usually works if you want some broad scopes. But if you really want, if you really care if there's part per billion levels of something, then you have to, you know, write all these out and actually, um, you know, solve a bunch of linear equations. And the one I would advise for students who are interested to look at some of that, that does it very well in biological systems, a former professor, I think it was at MIT, Alberti, uh, wrote a series of books on uh, bio chemical reaction thermodynamics, where he he uses packages like MATLAB and Mathematica and stuff, because they really are easy. You write yeah. out the 10 equations, and yes, it's hard to solve by hand. Ugh. Oh, yeah. You know, but, but that's, you're on computers, guys. Yeah. Like, yeah. you can throw those into a spreadsheet or throw those in, and, and these things that look very complicated get very easy to solve. Absolutely. So, I think that's an important point as well. Okay, uh, let's See if we can get this, you know, so what, uh, let's see if I, um, we have, it's, is it propane? No, no, it's propene. Yeah, the, yeah, it, it is, but uh, um, the, the identity. Going to Ooh, ethene and so, ethane. No, it's not right. propane, because that would be, that would be uh, eight, right? Yeah. Um, so it's a, a I, I, I didn't even look into what specifically this was, because it's not really relevant for the problem. No, uh, you just see. That's the problem with you theorists. You, you guys, you know, you just think of it as N and M, right? Like right. you know, right. as long as the N and M kind of work out, like right. <laughs> the rest of us think, uh, like, what gas is this? Okay. Yeah, um, it's ethene just, and ethane. Just a minor thing here. Notation. Six. This is the equilibrium constant, and this guy here, these are Kelvin units. So. We have to be careful here. Probably, in uh, I have to change that because we're using the same notation for the equilibrium constant and, and the units and, of and, a uh, Kelvin degrees. Okay. Yeah, because you're right. Otherwise, they might think this is. Yeah. Yeah, they might. The, yeah, this isn't. The, it's not taking the square of the yeah. equilibrium no, constant. No, no. Um, so this is just the units in such a way that. Kelvin divided by t give you. Yeah, so that they come out. Yeah. K squared divided t squared. A way of expanding. Yeah. But yeah. this is Kelvin. And this is the equilibrium constant. Constant, yeah. Okay. Okay, and you're asking him to solve that. And then I think finally, you know, the yeah. last one, and again, like most of the credit comes in just, you know, setting it up, you know, if they somehow miss, you know, a sign. Uh, if you don't get the like exact that. numbers or even, yeah. you know, but, you know, design. getting, you know, I would say really this is, you know, keyly where you, you know, this is where a lot of the credit 
uh, yeah, comes is, is knowing, you know. Because that's the key equation. Once you have that on the control, the other ones are. are right. Um, and then uh, finally, you're asking them to look at something that is forecasting to what they're coming up to this week. You know, the, the week they're taking the exam, we're doing electrochemistry. And this is asking a question that is, you know, chemical e pH is, you know, is covered in, in the chemical equilibrium chapter. But, it, but it's also what gets used a lot when first discussing electrochemistry because protons are the ions that set up a lot of the electrochemistry for biology. Yeah, um, and this is what I like so much about this question. Unfortunately, and, and we sent out a note about this, this question corresponds to a chapter that was- Oh, but it's the chapter but, but they're it's doing. Okay. It's, it's the okay. chapter they're currently doing. Right. It's a take-home right. exam. Right. They should be able to, right. this is where they're going anyway. This is a number almost every biologist should have in their, you know, memory almost like it's it's uh, you know um, you know if you look up cell membrane potentials in in, in most cells, I mean like these are common values, you know. Um, so and and you're asking to look at something that I would say from a biological perspective is incredibly important. You know? Yeah, because it's the the synthesis of a ATP from ADP. Yeah. And this particular problem, I mean, of course, this equation is not a standard one. But it is a, a, an equation that it is used in this context. It's a chemiosmotic theory. And it is given in the book. I mean, of course, there, there, we, we are not given a full derivation of this because that would be a little bit uh, complicated. But nevertheless, this is the equation. And it's a relatively simple equation because it connects, and this is the important thing, the, the intermembrane potential to the difference in pH. And, yeah. and this is essential. Yeah, and and I mean, you know, what? Let's face it. Between outside, proton pumps, I mean, is there a more important concept in biology? Uh, you know, ion pumps. You know, between proton pumps and maybe sodium potassium. Sodium I mean, potassium. that covers ninety percent of of yeah. what sets up most cell membrane potential yep. problems. Okay. Well, I know we've kind of taken a long time, students, on going through this, but our hope is that this discussion will really help you guys when it comes to the peer review process to make sure that you're able to look at your peers' exams and really give them as much partial credit as possible and be able to give them good, effective comments uh, uh, right. back and, and score them in a fair, meaningful way. And that it also hopefully helps you as students by looking at other students and how they explain things more solidify your own understanding, you yeah. know, in each because of these this is topics. Because this is the key part to realize that there might be some other explanation and then they, they might be correct or partially correct. Right. And we want to take in that, this into account in grading for you and for everybody else. Perfect. Well, thanks for going over this today. And... Uh, We'll make another video on, on future exams coming up. Thanks, Fadi. Yeah, thank you.